I have upgraded from Sony a6600 to Sony FX30. And in this video, I wanna tell you how I feel about this camera and if it's worth upgrading if you are shooting vlogs. Well, I got plenty of notes over here, so we're gonna have chapter markings for this video so you can jump to the section that you are most interested in. Now, before we start, we need to understand where I'm coming from because if you're watching a review of a particular piece of gear, you need to know how that person is using it. And obviously, you don't want to take um, wedding photography advice from a sports photographer. So you have to understand what I do and how I use my camera. And what I do is I'm a vlogger. I take my camera with me on trips, family adventures. I take them to work conferences and I do what they call run and gun shooting style. I bring my camera, I hold it in my hand while I do something else and I try to capture interesting moments that are happening to preserve memories and share with others. So that's kind of what my style of video making is. I don't have too much time to edit. Um, I just trying to get the best shots I can while doing something else like dealing with kids, meeting new people, uh, figuring out my transportation, getting on a plane. Uh, so a lot of active stuff is happening. The first question is gonna be why did I get this camera? And I've been shooting with A6500 first. That's how I started vlogging. Then I switched to A6600. As soon as that flip up screen came out, I, I had to have it make huge difference. And I used that camera for about three years and uh, once this camera came out, I, I felt like this is the next step for me. Uh, the reason why I felt that is this is a video centric camera, right? 6600 and 6500 are all photo cameras that also do videos. This puts video first and I wanted to experience that and I wanted to get uh, additional advantages of the flip out screen to the side and uh, just see if I can get better quality and image stabilization. So that's why I went and got this camera to try it out and see if it's gonna be a better fit for me. All right, so first we're gonna start with two biggest changes from A6600 to FX30 that jumped at me right away. And number one is the on-off switch is not here. This is now a zoom rocker. So your power switch has been moved to the side, which now requires you use two hands to operate it. And of course, if you're used to using 6600, you're gonna be hitting that to turn the camera on and off accidentally all the time. Now, the second thing that changed is there are no mode dial on top. You have to press the menu button to go into different modes and then use the wheel to select the mode. So those are the two absolutely biggest things that jumped out at me when I started using the camera. And of course, the screen flips to the side now, not to the top, but that's kind of obvious. Now, speaking of zoom rocker, it's actually more useful now than on A6600 because now I have a dedicated control for it. Uh, before, it was a little clumsy to use clear zoom. And clear zoom is something that I'm fairly interested in because it gives you ability to zoom in and basically use smaller portion of the sensor yet keeping the video at 4K. So this is actually a welcome upgrade and what i do is i zoom in to my subject and i i don't have enough i give it a little bit of extra magnification with a clear zoom that i set to zoom rocker so this is pretty cool and i imagine this would be good on gimbal when you can have a power zoom lens uh, but i haven't tested that yet all right, next, let's talk about screen. And as you can see, it flips out to the side as opposed to A6600, which flips up. So what's the difference? Well, whenever you vlogging, just uh, filming yourself, you occasionally glance at a screen. You either check the framing, make sure sound levels are good. And looking up above the lens is actually slightly better. It's not as distracting to a viewer. It kind of looks like you're thinking maybe. When you have screen to the side, it clearly looks like you're looking off to the side of the lens and like, what are you looking at kind of. Um, so if you're gonna be using flip to the side screen, 
you want to be doing very quick glances and not looking at it for too long unless you're wearing sunglasses or something like that uh, but i still like the flip to the side screen i feel like it's less um, obscured by other things and also you don't need a flash or microphone relocation bracket that you need for a6600 because if you put microphone on top then it's going to block the screen you have to relocate the the cold shoe to the side and then you put the microphone to the side then screen can flip up i always felt like that was mildly annoying not a big deal but uh, the other thing is we are missing viewfinder in this camera theoretically i would like to have a viewfinder maybe check things in the bright sunlight but practically i never used it so if it saves on weight and cost fine let it go not a big deal now the other thing is screen is touch sensitive so it's very nice to be able to use menus with touch however i still use the up and down and the scroll wheel to do that and i do have my uh, touch to focus off because when i'm filming i'm always grabbing the screen to move it and i am gonna hit it and i'm gonna make it you know focus on something or do something that i don't want to and trying to be careful and carefully open it up yeah that's not gonna work you know what, what you do is when you film and you just like you know, grabbing it and closing it you know you're not going to be like super careful uh, the only other downside to this screen is if you have it open and you want to rotate it it's actually going to hit things right if there's things plugged in or the door not super great a7r5 came out and they have a bit like a tray thing that comes out and then it flips out that's actually a better system um, but I, I'm okay with this. I usually just leave it like that. I either uh, look at the camera this way, flip it forward or back, and that's it. That's really all I do. I rarely need to open it and articulate it down or anything like that. That just doesn't seem to be unnecessary for my style of shooting. All right, let's talk about ergonomics. So first, on-off button. It has been moved, and now it makes it difficult to use camera with one hand. 6600, you can just flip it on, hit the record button, and you're filming. Reason it's important for me, because I could have a suitcase in my other hand, a tripod, a child, uh, I don't know what else I could be carrying. So having one-handed operation was actually really good. And this is a bit annoying that you need two hands to turn the camera on. The other thing about on-off switch, it's really tiny and really stiff. Obviously, it's stiff, so you don't accidentally turn it on and off. But here's what happened to me. I went to a conference, which was my first experience with this camera. It was about a three-day conference. And I came back with about 600-something uh, shots, like maybe 650. So I turned this camera on about 600 times, and I turned this camera off about 600 times. And it's such a tiny and stiff switch that I was starting to feel something in my finger. Now, it wasn't bad. It's not like, you know, playing guitar that you need to build up calluses. But if the conference were to go on for an extra day or two, I could see, you know, maybe I would have to use a different finger. Um, it just feels like if you're constantly switching on and off, uh, there's a chance that your finger is going to hurt. Now, moving on to this button, the front shutter. Um, very cool idea but it's on the other side so if you're vlogging and you want to press it you're kind of reaching across if you're holding camera in the right hand of course so mm, mildly useful nice to have i still i still like it but it's kind of cool now the thing i really don't like are these dials um they very plasticky they're very stiff and they hard to use without introducing camera shake. You really have to get in there and turn it. And I just, I just don't like it. If I take my old Nikon camera and see how the dials are, they are like slightly rubbery. They stick out a little bit more. The, the stiffness of them is just feels so much better. And same problem exists on A6600. The dials are just not good. They're not they don't feel good and they're not great to operate while you're shooting. You are going to introduce shake, uh, like if you want to be like a Casey Neistat style, you know, when you're filming and you're changing exposure while you're doing, you know, that's not going to work. Um, dials are just not good. 
Nikon and Canon are way better at figuring out how dials um, should feel. Moving on to the grip, and grip is much better than 6600. Um, it makes camera much more manageable, right? So if you have like a heavier lens, with 6600, it feels like the camera is too small for the lens. And sometimes you, you know, even your finger kind of falls off. You don't have enough space to grab it. With this camera, you have a really good grip on it. So even though it's a bigger camera, grip is really nice and you can really hold on to it. And it is very comfortable. Do I want it to be a thinner? Absolutely. Um, do I want to not to have a fan? Maybe because fan is just another area for water to get in when I go on like hiking and stuff, you know, things, rain starts and all kinds of things happen. Uh, as far as uh, fan noise though, I honestly haven't heard it because I am generally in the loud environments anyway. So I felt it like I turned the camera on, I'm like, oh, oh, there's air blowing, like, but I never really heard it. So, and I never have it register in the microphone. Again, just because the environments I shoot in are noisy to begin with. All right, let's talk about sound next. Now, these uh, preamps, I guess, what they're called in camera, are different than what they are in other Sony cameras. And so you will have to reset your sound settings and retest your microphones and make sure everything is good. Don't just take a microphone from all cameras, slap it on here, put the same numbers on everything and assume it's gonna be good. It may not be. I had to readjust all the sound settings. You have to retest everything. Now, the best thing about this camera that I did not know exists when I bought it is a volume limiter. So on the older Sony, if the sound level is too high, it'll just crackle, distort, and it's not gonna, uh, not gonna be usable. This camera will automatically limit the sound level so it doesn't distort huge huge for me i absolutely love it i'm always in unpredictable environments i don't know what's going to happen sometimes things get loud sometimes they get quiet and this camera is is just amazing at it this volume limiting feature i cannot state how good this is like i probably would have ordered it even sooner if i could if i knew it has that so that that made a big difference for me the one thing that's kind of weird is when you're looking at the levels of your microphone, there is no, so there is like a green bar showing you levels, but usually there is a yellow and red and there is no yellow and red. So I am, I'm a little confused. Like I don't have enough confidence. Like, do I have it dialed in right? Is it not right? You know, and then there's a volume limiter that's going to help me. I'm a little, cons you know, not concerned, but I'm a little unsure of my levels whenever I set them, but I'm sure I'll figure that out with experience. Now, the bad things about sound, the really bad things. So if you look at the microphone jack over here, you can actually put your finger on it and move it around. It, the, the jack wobbles internally and it has a lot of movement, which makes me really uncomfortable. Um, Everything connects fine, I, everything worked, but even when you plug it in, there is so much wobble that it feels like something isn't connected internally. It is really weird and doesn't make me feel good. And one time I did have a microphone pop out just a little bit, um, and that of course ruined the shot, but look, luckily I caught it in time. So if you're not careful and you kind of turn in the, the, the jack around, and you hit the door, it may push it up a little bit and it'll pop out. So that is really not good. And you should be monitoring your levels all the time to make sure nothing like that has happened. Now onto the autofocus. Sony has probably the best autofocus of all the cameras and it's something I completely rely on. As a vlogger, I have to have the best autofocus out there. And Sony is pretty much the best. Canon's probably right behind it. Maybe some will argue it's the same, uh, but it is. it has been great on A6600 and it is really good on this camera too. I haven't had any issues with it on this camera. 
Uh, the only little problem I had on A6600 is when you're talking and you have trees in the background and the trees touch the sky, you have this really bright portion on top, tops of the trees, actually probably like that. Um, you will get occasional like a flicker, like a back and forth. I don't know if it's autofocus or auto exposure or something. I haven't figured out what that is. And I definitely seen it on A6600. I haven't taken this outside enough to know if this is a problem or not but normal autofocus works really, really well. Now let's talk about image stabilization. And as a vlogger, as a person who handhelds the camera, I will take all the image stabilization I can get. The goal for me is to have stabilization as good as GoPro, which obviously isn't possible with the big sensor and everything. Uh, and this camera adds the active stabilization, which digitally crops a little bit. I have it on all the time. My stabilization is maxed out to whatever I can get. And it is definitely an improvement over A6600. It is not as good as I would like it to have. I want more. Um, but practically using the camera, I found that it works pretty well. Right, the shots are totally usable and even A6600, they're usable, just have to be, you know, not to shake the camera intentionally. And same thing here, it is an improvement and it works. I'm happy with it. If I could get more, I would take it. Now there is a Sony software that you can use to do additional stabilization after the fact. I just don't have time to put my video through two software packages, right? That's just not gonna happen. Um, I'm gonna take my footage and it's gonna go into my video editor and I'm just gonna use it there and I'll apply some stabilization there if I feel like I need to, but I'm not gonna be using two pieces of software. And same thing with focus breathing, I'm not gonna, you know, this camera has some kind of compensation for that. I'm not gonna put it through two pieces of software, um, mostly because I don't find it distracting. I don't think it's a big deal if the camera zooms in and out a little bit, like, and, and my viewers aren't gonna see that either. So not, not worth the effort. So how does this camera do in low light? Well, it's better, better than a 6600, but it's not magic. You still get grainy footage and I could, you know, it could be better. I would like it to be better, but what I did is I purchased Sigma 14 millimeter f1.4 lens and for the price that lens is amazing. I think it's $300 or something like that. So whenever I go into environment like a social event, some kind of party, I would put that lens on. It's wide enough to vlog with and I can get away with pretty much shooting everything at a party with 16 millimeter and being 1.4. It, it takes so much light in that completely compensates for lack of sensitivity. Now, would I want to have a better light sensitivity? Sure. Am I willing to pay double the price for FX3? No, absolutely not. It's totally not worth it. I would rather upgrade twice as quick than pay double the money. And the other thing my viewers aren't going to appreciate that uh, a lot of shots, things are happening quick, and if something is grainy a little bit, no one's gonna care. I'm not gonna care. You know, it's about the story, it's about things that are happening. It's not about that perfect image quality and if it's not like, you know, grainy or something like that. So the other thing, if you are using 16 uh, millimeter lens, you do have that clear zoom, so you can do a little bit of zooming in and out uh, so you can compensate uh, for not having a zoom. Again, low light is reasonable enough. Um, improvement over 6600, not magical, but very good. Now onto color and image quality. And I don't have a good quantifiable way of saying it. I would just say that it's really good. Uh, image quality is really good. Uh, white balance, I had to set it on auto plus ambient, otherwise it was just really sucking out all the color. Um, I wanted a little bit more ambience because I'm not gonna spend so much time grading and all that. 
Uh, I also have a D-range optimizer maxed out. Again, I want to get the best shot I can from the camera. I know you can do log and you can do all kinds of stuff. I want to get the best shot I can from the camera and then I want to do a little bit of adjustment in post-processing and that's it and move on to the next shot. I'm not going to spend, you know, mi minutes or whatever hours people spend trying to grade each shot. I get what I get, some improvements, some tweaks, maybe I'll adjust a bit of a color, brightness, done, next. The other thing that's new on this camera are menus. Going from 6600 to this, you will notice a different menus that are touch sensitive. So you can operate with a touch every menu in camera, which is good. Uh, overall menus are better. They are better organized, but because I'm used to a6600, I, okay, either way, I was able to find what I need there and I can find what I need here too. So it's an improvement. I like it. I'll take it. And I actually don't use touch sensitivity for menus much. I still use the up and down and that works for me fine. So good improvement, not necessarily revolutionary as some people would say, it's better organized. And yes, that's good. Time-lapse in 4K, this is huge. For some reason in 2022, there are very few cameras that can shoot time-lapse in 4K. I don't know why it's a big deal, why you can't shoot uh, 4K in 30 frames, but not at one frame. So A6600 doesn't do it. iPhone 14 doesn't do it. The only camera I had that would shoot 4K time-lapse is a GoPro, and that's a super wide angle lens, so you can't use it for everything. This finally, finally can shoot time-lapse in 4K, something that I really, really wanted. And now I have it. I am very happy about that. How's battery life? Well, it's very good. Uh, it uses the newer battery that most Sony cameras use. So it's good as expected. I vlogged, uh, for one example, I vlogged for a whole day and I had three really long takes, like over 45 minutes where there were people just sitting there talking. And between those three takes and shooting all day, I used two batteries and they weren't fully discharged. They still had some life in them. So I would feel okay using one battery for a whole day, but I would still bring a backup. I would bring a second battery just in case, even if it's an off-brand battery. Just in case something stupid happens, you leave the camera on, I don't know, maybe you shoot for longer than expected, just having that one extra battery could really save your butt. Now, the other thing to know about batteries is well, I thought this camera comes with a dedicated AC charger. It doesn't, FX3 does, this one didn't. And charging of batteries takes absolutely forever. The battery it came, that came with this camera was dead, was 0%. And it took probably half a day to charge it. So if you expect to get this camera, put the battery in and go have fun, that's not happening. If you don't have an extra battery to put in, you'll be waiting for it to charge for a long, long time. So um, external charger, separate charger is recommended if you have multiple batteries. So you're coming back to, you know, uh, in, on your vacation, you're coming back to the room and you want to plug it in, have something charging, take the camera with you. Uh, so you're not stuck without a camera and using it as a charger. Moving on to SD cards. This does take that CF Express type A you generally don't need it. It's only if you're going to be shooting really high bit rate, the all eye compression. So practically speaking, you don't need CF Express. Just get a quality SD cards. It's, um, I believe it's V90. That's the one you should get. It's the faster of the SD cards. If you get that, you'll be able to use all the shooting modes and you shouldn't have any issues. You don't need to waste money on expensive cards. As far as um, multiple slots here, you can put two and record to both at the same time. I don't do it. I know a lot of people say backup, backup, have backups. Um, things that I shoot aren't that critical. You know, if I lose something, it's not a big deal. I'm gonna be sad about it, but 
I'll, I'll be fine. Also, I've been buying quality memory cards and I haven't had any issues. I only had issue like once when I was doing photography and I didn't think I lost anything, just had a couple of errors show up on the screen, but then I was able to copy data over. So over 20 years of doing this, things have been pretty good as far as memory cards, no corruptions. I always format my card before I start using it. So I don't feel like I need to use two memory cards. If you are shooting something that's one time, like it will never happen again, like a wedding, or someone's paying you, absolutely back yourself up, put two memory cards in there, have it right to both, you know, that's, that's totally reasonable thing to do. If you're on vacation, just following around, I don't think that's necessary. Okay, moving on to rolling shutter. It's been bad on a 6600. It's present here. Do I care? No, it doesn't matter. I occasionally pan. I do see things kind of get skewed. Not, doesn't bother me. I don't think it bothers my viewers. Not something I'm very much concerned. Sure, if I was doing like sports photography a lot, it'd probably be a lot more noticeable, but with what I should, really doesn't matter. So next I wanna talk about some of the things that I haven't tested or I haven't made up my mind as to best way to use it. And this is where I'm hoping maybe you can uh, comment in the comment section, let me know your experience with those things. And first is H.264 versus H.265 and 8-bit versus 10-bit. Now I'm a tech guy. I know what the compressions are. I know how they work. I know what the difference between 8 and 10-bit. And I've seen these uh, charts online where people show like, oh, look at all this bending you're gonna get if you shoot 8-bit or something like that. But whenever people try to replicate that, they never could. So those are like the charts where color gradients just completely breaks up. Those are like extreme examples. And for me, I'm still not sure how does these two settings translate to a real world video results, right? So you theoretically, I understand how it works, but if you take two cameras and you shoot and H.264 8-bit and the other one H.265, let's say 10-bit. Will you be able to practically see the difference? And something tells me barely. Uh, and, and it comes back to again, will your or my viewers notice and appreciate it? Maybe not. Again, that's something I need to figure out for myself. Maybe I will put two cameras side by side and I'll go shoot different types of footage, bring it home and um, examine it and then make up my mind. The other thing is log shooting. Again, I don't do that. I know this camera, probably everyone who has this camera is gonna be like log shooting all the way, you know, S-Log3. I having a bit of difficulty getting better results using log and grading it manually or even with a lot than what the camera does internally. Either my colors are off or something feels off and I always seem like I put a lot of effort into grading and it's just as good as the camera or not even there. And it doesn't feel like the effort is paying off. Probably me, I need to learn grading better, but at the same time, I, it may not be worth, you know, grading 600 shots when I'm trying to put a quick vlog together. Um, the feature that I didn't use in this camera that I should have is called variable frame rate. That's when you shoot indoors under artificial lights, LEDs generally, and you see the lights tend to flicker or you see bending. What this camera should be able to do is adjust frame rate up and down a little bit to compensate for it. At the trip I went to recently, I definitely had that on a few shots, not a big deal, but I should have had turned this on, which I didn't, I completely forgot about it. So that's an interesting thing to to keep in mind and it should be turned on. And the next thing is a phone control. Um, controlling your camera from a phone is always a pain in the butt. I don't know why it, it disconnects. You have to turn the Bluetooth off. You have to reconnect every time you turn on and off the camera. I don't know. I haven't tried it with this. Maybe at some point I will test that out. 
So now I want to talk about my wish list, what I wish this camera had that I don't think it does. And number one is whenever you are using presets, sometimes you have to change settings temporarily. And what happens is you, you forget that you have changed them. So perfect example for me would be I'm shooting something and sound gets too low, so I bump up my sound levels. And then a person comes over, goes, hey, Nikola, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a long time. And then I turn the camera off and we wind up talking. And five minutes later, I'm like, okay, let me, you know, get a shot of that. And I turn the camera on, but I completely forget that my sound levels have been changed. Same thing could be with exposure compensation. That's a little bit easier to see. Um, but there are settings that do get modified occasionally. So what I want is once I saved my preset, if something is changed, I want a really big indicator saying you're not shooting with your preset. So when you start recording, a big red box comes up around the frame telling you you're filming. Well, I want to have a big yellow box telling me that, hey, I know you saved the preset, but you're not using it right now. So that would save me from uh, ruining shots for sure. The second thing I wish this camera had is to lock the orientation. So when you turn the camera on with two hands, sometimes you have something in your hand and you would bring the camera here, turn it on. And then as you bring it up, you hit the record like as soon as possible, you know, because something is happening that you want to capture. And the camera may think like, you know, you're at 45 degrees camera may think you are in this orientation, not that. And then you get videos that are vertical. Now, it is not a big deal to rotate them, which I had to do with maybe four or five shots. I just wish it didn't happen. I want to just set the camera like, look, we're not doing Instagram here. We're doing normal uh, landscape. Just lock it this way and leave it. All right, we're at the end of the video. We're at the last part. And is it worth upgrading from a6600 to FX30? So it is a bigger camera. It is thicker, it is bigger. And I had a hard time finding pictures comparing the two to get a clear understanding. So it is much bigger, but it has a really good grip and it feels really good in the hand and it balances really well, especially with slightly bigger lenses. So because of that, I wouldn't knock down the size too much. It's a, it's a comfortable camera and it's pleasant to use. Um, it does have a better stabilization and sound improvements. So that, I would say this makes it worth it for me uh, just because of the volume limiter and that the stabilization has been improved. Well, significantly the active stabilization as a vlogger, that's something I need. As far as video quality, it's hard for me to say like this one is much better than the other. I think I'll need to do that side-by-side -side comparison. I would say video looks good subjectively. It looks better, uh, but I don't know by how much. So because of that, the way I would summarize, is it worth it like this? If you shooting on a6600 and you getting good results and you have your workflow established and you are doing good, the results are what you want, then you may not want to upgrade. This is just going to mess you up because controls are going to be in different place. Things are going to be different. You're going to have different encodings with videos. Um, it may cause more confusion and problems before you learn all this. However, if you're looking for that better stabilization volume limiter and you can afford it, then yeah, this is pretty cool. I would, I would say do it. But if it's going to um, put a dent in your budget, then maybe not. I would say this is a nice to have upgrade, but not necessarily a must have. So those are my initial thoughts on FX30. I'm sure as I use it more, I will discover more interesting things and I'll put it in other situations like more outdoor use. When I have more opinions, I will be sure to share with them in the follow-up videos if there are going to be any. Thank you for checking out this video. See you on another.